That being said, uh, Dan and Don, thanks for having me. It's good to see old friends, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So my challenge was given to me was to talk to you about how you can understand the occurrence of kidney disease in the southeast. End-stage renal disease continues to be an extraordinary problem nationwide. It is argued that the rate of growth has improved. We're not having as many people end up on, it, on replacement therapy with dialysis or transplant, but as you can see, it's still climbing up with the most recent data. If you ask what puts people on dialysis in need, need of a kidney transplant, you can see it's predominantly diabetes, hypertension, uh, followed by glomerular disease where there's a merging knowledge about the antibodies and antigens that cause that process. Also in the other category are a number of conditions, some are congenital, but others are actually totally treatable, such as analgesic abuse. That being said, among the causes of end-stage renal disease, of kidney injury, the great predominance of all of them are totally preventable and treatable, and indeed that's encouraging. So with that national perspective that we have a lot of injury still occurring to kidneys, what's happening in the southeast? The southeast, that area we love, that area that actually uh, represents the Southern Medical Association, which is a place with beautiful areas. This is a place with rivers and beaches and gorgeous mountains that currently are blazing in multicolored foliage right now. If you've not come to Virginia's western area, come and bring some money. If you don't come, just send the money. We're also defined by our music, whether it's Elvis and Graceland, the blues in Memphis, or a good old-fashioned uh, Dixieland in New Orleans. We also are defined by sports. NASCAR, believe it or not, for all you soccer fans, is the largest spectator sport anywhere in the United States. Maybe not in the world, but uh, down here it's actually race cars, Clemson football, Auburn football, and indeed uh, UNC Chapel Hill basketball. But more than that, more than all of those things, we are defined by food. Why do you think you're meeting in Charleston? It takes you one week to eat your way through Charleston, two weeks to eat your way through New Orleans. And that's when you know the good places like Antoine's or, or Commander's Palace where John Goodman has a key to the back door. Indeed, the highlight of this year's Southern uh, State Fairs were Krispy Kreme hamburgers. Indeed, uh, that was the hottest item in Raleigh two weeks ago on the fairgrounds. So this is where we live. This is our world. This is what makes us feel good, warm and fuzzy. And indeed, we have one more claim to fame in the Southeast. We have the most dialysis units of any region in this country. We have more people on dialysis or receiving home dialysis or being transplanted than anywhere else. The snapshot on the right, which you'll see on the sequential slides of the, United, the Southern United States, shows you the actual incidents. That's the number of folks starting dialysis. Dan Lapland told me about incidents many years ago with that Rochella versus prevalence. These are the folks that are starting each year. These are the folks in whom 80% of their dialysis needs could have been prevented. And our challenge in the few minutes we're together is your understanding what you can do as a healthcare provider to help prevent that process from occurring by knowing what the risk factors are. So there are 20 risk factors. Uh, the grid is a little askew because uh, Southern diet fits better under metabolic syndrome, but 20 is a nice number to remember. As was shown by Dr. Sin, some are inherited, some are modifiable. The ones in bright yellow are inherited. You can't do much about this, but you need to understand it. And among these, is the one shown at the bottom, which is low birth weight. My good friend Dan Lacklin and his colleagues at Medical University of South Carolina gave us two important observations about the risk of cardiovascular disease and with that kidney disease. And that is uh, not shown here. If you're born in South Carolina, you have a higher risk of having cardiovascular events as compared to being born, for instance, in the beautiful state of New York City, of New York. Shown here, though, is Dan's and his colleagues' data about birth weights. And there is, they wrote in the article, a sweet spot. Now, for those of you who don't deliver babies, I'm an internal medicine doc. You've got to be over 16 and not pregnant for me to talk to you, okay? That being said, a 3,000, 3,500 gram baby is seven pounds. 
Uh, so seven pounds is where you probably have what might be called baseline cardiovascular risk. If you're a small weight birth baby, whoever made you didn't give you enough nephrons uh, to, su to support you in the sense that uh, you're mismatched and you have an increased prevalence of kidney disease and other cardiovascular risk. If you're a heavy baby, over seven pounds, and those are usually mothers with maternal gestational diabetes, you in fact have too many, too much body for the nephrons you were given, and you have also a mismatch. The number one risk factor that you as a primary care or healthcare provider can address is shown in the red. Diabetes mellitus, obesity, and the metabolic syndrome, integrally related, the excessive body weight drives most of the problems with this, creating metabolic syndrome with altered lipids, uh, increasing blood pressures, and the whole cascade of hormonal events that are triggered by that process, leading ultimately to uh, insulin resistant type 2 diabetes in most cases, though type 1 has the same risk also. That being said, it's helpful, I think, if you very briefly understand the pathophysiology, which will give a basis for some of the set subsequent speakers to address in diabetic and hypertensive renal disease. It's currently believed, as I understand the literature, that everything about diabetic renal disease is driven by the glucose. So if the sugar's high, two things happen. One, by being an elevated blood sugar, there's an elevated oncotic pressure in the blood. The blood volume expands, there's higher flow through the glomerulus, there's a pressure phenomenon of just too much blood trying to get through a space. But in addition to that, it's been shown that either the high sugar or perhaps the relatively high insulin or things we don't yet understand damage the endothelium lining the arteries coming into the glomerulus. This is the afferent, this is glomerulus, this is the efferent, urine's made here down the nephron. And indeed that endothelial damages causes a production of angiotensin II within the kidney, not in the bloodstream in general. So there's relatively high ang2 in the glomerulus, and indeed that causes several things to happen. There is constriction at the distal efferent, capital E, vessel leaving glomerulus through an AT1 receptor, increasing resistance. So if resistance is high here, there's high flow from the sugar here, so there's more and more mechanical pressure. Dr. Ishizaka, at Vanderbilt demonstrated 20 years ago that the angiotensin II literally opens pores in the glomerulus to allow more albumin to be filtered, more than the proximal tubule can reabsorb, so one starts to get albuminuria. The beauty of understanding this is glycemic control can stop this process and effectively completely blocking the AT1 receptor with an angiotensin receptor blocking drug can indeed reduce albuminuria normalize the pressure across the glomerulus and indeed be therapeutic. As can ACE inhibitors shown by the group at Vanderbilt in animal studies through the effects of bradykinin. But there's another mechanism in diabetes that's also prevalent and critical to understand. It turns out that indeed in the glomerulus, in the mesangial cells, which is like the stalk of an umbrella supporting the glomerulus, the mesangial cells do not have insulin resistance. Uh, this was shown years ago by Wayne Border in Utah, so that when the sugar's up, sugar freely moves into the mesangial cell as compared to its resistance to moving into muscle cells. And again, within the mesangial, mesangium, that's the matrix in the center of the glomerulus, angiotensin II is locally generate, gen, generated. The ANG2 does the things you heard about before, but it also turns on something called transforming growth factor beta shown by Wayne Border in tissue cultures of human kidney cells. And indeed, it is that TGF beta that causes extraordinary fibrosis within the glomerulus. And that's what kills the kidney, the fibrosis. Indeed, they all work hand in hand, and they're all triggered by high sugar. You end up with, compared to a normal kidney on your left, a Kimmel Steel Wilson with all these globs a material which is TGF beta and to generated materials that is what actually eliminates the filtration and heads the patient towards dialysis. I remind you, all of these things are treatable and preventable. This is a snapshot from the CDC over three periods of time, as you can see across the top, 94, 2000, 2015, and it's a slide, the picture of the U.S. gets redder and redder. 
Indeed, the prevalence of number of people who have excessive body weight, and that's paralleled by those having diabetes, has been growing uh, prospectively and just all through the time, and then more recent numbers have the same increasing large-sized folks in the southeast with a tremendously high prevalence of type 2 diabetes. Underlying that process and separate from it in the sense of not just weight gain itself is what we all enjoy immensely. Uh, I had the privilege of being at one of my favorite Charleston restaurants last night to have a whole flounder, which are hard to find outside of Charleston. I'm sure most of you ate at another great place, whether it was high cotton blossoms, Anson's, uh, or if you had a two month ahead reservation husk, but you had some good food. And indeed it is the Southern diet characterized by bread, fried foods, organ meats, processed meats, egg, huge fat <laughs> that dairy, should be high, sorry about that, but huge is the nice, the slip of the key. And sugar sweetened beverages, my goodness. you <laughs> Sweet tea is the default south of Washington, D.C. It's amazing. Well, I appreciated Dr. Sin mentioning to you the regards study. This study, just to give you a little more understanding, is a remarkable epidemiological event. Indeed, 6,897 6, patients were studied in this, this process. They went and found these folks, and they chose the patients to be included to have more folks in the Southeast than they did in the entire United States. Indeed, it's a Southeastern, if you will, uh, public health risk study. Mean age was 62, a fourth of the folks were, Afri were said to be black, half, a little over half were women. It was a 10-year trial, 9.4 average. They called these folks, asked them to come in for some basic screening tests and define whether they had hypertension. They then had serial follow-ups and then at 10 years rechecked everyone so that over that period of 10 years, 46% of the folks who were black developed new onset hypertension compared to baseline and one third of those who were white. When they did correlations over that period of time about the lifestyles these individuals had chosen to follow, there was a very significant correlation among black men developing hypertension, a risk factor for all the things we were gonna talk about this morning, mainly eating the Southern diet with a relatively high sodium, low potassium ratio, uh, lesser educated, sometimes that means lesser preventive health care. Among the black women who had a high prevalence also were being heavier, larger waist circumference, thinking metabolic syndrome, and not following the DASH diet. The southern diet is the antithesis to the DASH eating plan, so uh, there's sort of been a negative situation. But the point is that the southern diet, as we uh, traditionally know it, is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Second to diabetes is hypertension. Carla showed you a slide similar to this before. If you look at the picture on the right, the darkest red have the most high blood pressure, followed by the pink and followed by those in Montana and Utah and Wyoming, where there's not only not as many people, but indeed that have less hypertension. That being said, 40% uh, or so of the Southeast still have hypertension as a problem. The redder states have more than the, uh, if you will, the yellow states. You need to understand about hypertension also and its mechanism, and it's really simple, and it's been worked out by Dr. Guyton and other people over the past 30, 40 years. So if you don't remember your basic physiology and anatomy, you have two kidneys if the person who made you got you built right. You have a renal artery that brings blood into the kidney, and it breaks up into the beltway of the kidney known as the arcuate artery. From that, our little arteries going up to the cortex of the kidney, Intralobar and budding off of them like grapes on a vine in Napa are glomeruli. Indeed, this is one of your glomeruli, this is one of your nephrons. And coming into that nephron is a relatively larger, capital A, afferent arteriole. Filtration occurs here, urine is made into the tubule. This is Bowman's space in blue, and in fact, it exits through a smaller, efferent, capitalized word E artery that takes the blood away. To get blood to the efferent arteriole, you must go through the glomerulus, and if your flow is good through your efferent arteriole, you will have good flow through this cascade of capillaries wrapped around the nephron, nicknamed vasa recta, and all the nourishment to your nephron is based on flow through the efferent arteriole. So if you have no flow there, you have no flow nourishing your tubule, and your tubular cells will die. 
It turns out that angiotensin II is critical in this. So if this artery, when there is high pressure, goes into spasm, known as autoregulation, without any hormonal or neuronal input, the pressure goes up, the artery narrows, flow is slow because the nephron thinks you are bleeding and your, your volume's low, but when your pressure's high, the spasm occurs. Flow is slow here. There's cells just beyond that entry to the glomerulus called JG cells that release renin, which subsequently generates ANG2 in the kidney. ANG2 constricts the efferent arteriole, so you've got spasm here, lower flow. Spasm here to maintain filtration pressure. The dog's still peeing, but all of your nephron is ischemic. And if you leave the pressure up, indeed, you will infarct your tubule, your nephron. And we know now that probably the lower pressures, though this has not been studied in the kidney, with our most recent recommendations, is less than 120 systolic, which is really getting it down there. Drugs that interfere with angiotensin II can indeed reduce the efferent resistance, improve the flow, and in controlling the blood pressure by taking the pressure off the spastic artery here and blocking A2, you can make this entire system be more normal. But unfortunately, in most patients, that does not occur. The hypertension is identified after the process has been sustained. Everyone in uh, medical school knows you can look in the artery of the retina of your eye and see the apparent arterial is counterpart. Unfortunately, treatment doesn't occur, so you get from the spasm, onion ringing, as it were, of smooth muscle cells, continued ischemia, and these little teeny small infarcts as these nephrons die on the cortex, and the patient ends up on dialysis, which could have been completely prevented had blood pressure been controlled. So how well do we control blood pressure? Almost 25 years ago, Dr. Ferrario and myself developed the Consortium for Southeastern Hypertension Centers, a group of voluntary physicians and practices across the Southeast who had one mission in, in that mind, to prevent vascular disease in all people. And we've been somewhat uh, moving towards that in small steps. For the past three years, COSAC has been chosen as one of the uh, Medicare CMS transitional organizations. We are one of 14 in the United States. We are the largest. And as a snapshot about how well we do, because this is, this is probably as good as it gets if you exclude the BA data, and Dr. Basil will be glad to tell you the BA has very good blood pressure control in the programs that he's helped put in place. But in the southeast where we live, a snapshot of how we've done, this is a half million patients and 109 practice sites throughout the southeast. And this is after a year and a half of two years of going into these practices where they had 60% of JNC level control levels of blood pressure, they were able to increase it to 69%. Snapshot, one third of the people in good working hard practices to get the pressure down are still not at gold levels. Nationally, it's said to be somewhat better. In the southeast, we do not have as good a control of blood pressure as we would like to. And we have a huge problem that I'm not going to show you data on about access to care in the southeast. We are definitely underserved. Our community in Danville is an underserved area. Well, after diabetes, the southern diet, hypertension, if you think about what in the south is unique to cardiovascular disease, it is smoking cigarettes. We created the industry. It said that Dr. Duke did up there, as we nicknamed Duke University at home. You want to go down and see Dr. Duke if you're in Danville? James Duke and his uh, bequest created the Duke University Medical Center, as did R.J. Reynolds in Winston-Salem, which created Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center and School of Medicine, where Dr. Ferrario and I have the privilege to be uh, members of that faculty. But indeed, uh, used to be doctors who told you there were better cigarettes to smoke. But unfortunately, in the southeast, looking at the red states, one out of five people still smoke. In Danville, Virginia, it's as much as 40% of our population smokes. Huge, huge problem. Definitely a risk factor for not only kidney disease, uh, end-stage renal disease, but all the cardiovascular disease. Finally, you have illicit drugs and analgesic abuse. How did this happen? Well, it turns out that in 1911, that's when the first Indianapolis 500 race was run. That's the year the Titanic uh, took a float. It was started, it was released. And in that year, a good man named Germain Bernard 
in Raleigh, North Carolina, at Five Points Pharmacy, one block from where my wife's family used to live. And the same year, Tom Standback in Thomasville, where they have the big chair there in the town square, they both came up with a winning combination. Aspirin, finacid, and caffeine. This is good stuff. These are APCs. I went to college with a bottle of these. Two of these and the headache's gone, and you feel great. And indeed, it turns out that that was a huge problem. These have had huge cultural promotions, as you can see from the king of NASCAR and Trace Adkins. And in fact, 800 people started dialysis in this year because of that. That has transitioned from APCs to opioids. Martinsville, Virginia, which is part of my hospital's area of service, had the largest number of opioid prescriptions written in the nation last year, number one. And indeed, that transition has not only been for opioid use from APCs, but to high-risk behavior closely associated with HIV. Both of these, though hard to treat, are treatable and now preventable processes. And finally, there's this whole issue about patients with impaired renal disease not, had, not getting recognition so they can have prevention. The most recent guidelines for referring patients with early CKD is when they're down to CKD3 or 30 cc's, they should see a nephrologist. But as you can see, this data here demonstrates that only about 10% with creating clearances less than 30 cc's have been referred to a nephrologist who can help with better blood pressure control and managing that. Uh, late referral is a real problem in recognizing for patients. So here's what you take home with you. The risk factors for kidney disease in southern patients. If you are a low or higher than average birth weight, if you're African American or older, if you're excessively large, if you love a southern diet all the time, have hypertension or diabetes, if you continue to smoke, if you take analgesics or opioids in excess or using them as illicit drugs, have risky behavior for HIV or hepatitis C, both of which can lead to insane renal disease, and if you do have CKD, no, your primary care provider hasn't told you, we did a study in 1986, and 86% of the people we put on dialysis that year knew about it the day we went in their room and said, we're going to put in a subclavian catheter in about 20 minutes, you need to be on dialysis. Oh, really? And almost all of them had a primary care doctor. So I hope this information is helpful to you. If you're helping and taking care of patients, that's what you need to look for. Thanks a bunch.